Passenger cars and motorcycles, as well as parts for both, account for most of Indian vehicle exports to the African continent. Motorcycles have become indispensable components of urban and rural transport across some of Africa's fast-growing and still poorly connected economies. Two-wheeler exports registered a growth of 7.3% in the financial year 2019 and 2020. The major export markets of the Made in India two-wheelers are African and Latin American countries, the biggest African markets being Nigeria, Angola and Uganda. Indian motorcycle exports have increased by 175% to Africa since 2008, with the most pronounced ascent in Egypt, 850%, Rwanda, 870%, and Sierra Leone and Djibouti, both over 1,000%. According to Standard Bank's research, Indian-based Bajaj Auto, the world's fourth largest manufacturer of motorcycles and auto rickshaws, export to 35 African countries. Frost & Sullivan's recent analysis, Global Electric Vehicle Market Outlook 2020, as the market recovers after COVID-19, it is predicted to experience a healthy growth, an optimistic scenario. Electric vehicles are estimated to grow to 2.5 million unit sales, including battery electric vehicles plus plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, globally in 2020. Sulaja Firodia Motwani, Vice Chairperson, Kinetic Engineering and Founder and CEO, Kinetic Green Energy and Power Solutions Limited. Michael Mabasa, CEO NAMSA, National Association of Automobile Manufacturers of South Africa. Yanniko Dunhauser, Product and Pricing Manager, Jaguar Land Rover South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. The moderator is CNBC Africa anchor Fifi Peters. Good afternoon to you all and of course thank you so much for joining the Indo-Africa Summit for 2021. Let's get straight to this discussion and Michael I'd like to begin with you. Uh, the uh, car market, automotive market has traditionally played quite an important role in keeping the wheels of the South African economy turning and it's uh, most likely to play an even bigger role in assisting our recovery from COVID-19. How would you describe that current state of recovery and the role that electrification will play in driving us forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for having me, Fifi. Good to see you and uh, to my panelists as well. Absolutely. So South Africa has gone through some very challenging uh, time. Uh, 2020 was a very difficult year for us. Uh, we've seen some stages, uh, very, very uh, challenging stages of lockdown uh, restrictions in the country, which impacted mainly on the four key performance indicators that we chase. Uh, and we look at every month. So we look at, because South Africa is a vehicle producing country, we produce uh, you know, vehicles in, in, in South Africa. We are actually the 22nd biggest uh, producer of vehicles globally. Uh, that has obviously had a major implications for us uh, in terms of the vehicles that we're producing. Um, and we've also become a very huge export market um, you know, as South Africa because 64% of what we are producing in South Africa is actually sold out of the country as exports. And naturally, because of COVID-19, we've seen a very huge decline uh, of about 30% in terms of our export volumes uh, in 2020. Um, and naturally, obviously, this has had a major implication uh, you know, for the industry as a whole. The second key performance indicator that we look at is obviously imports, because we bring in uh, you know, imports into the country from different countries, uh, such as India, because we do have a number of Indian brands in the market. Uh, and unfortunately, those brands did not come as big as we, we had expected, uh, primarily because of the fact that a number of uh, you know, markets obviously had their own lockdown restrictions and the value chain was uh, naturally impacted upon, particularly also uh, our supply chain uh, in terms of making sure that we are able to bring those vehicles into the country. That obviously had a huge impact on us. And then the third uh, KPI that we look at is obviously new vehicle sales in the country, uh, which has also gone down by 29% in 2020, um, uh, which is very, very huge for us. And, and to put that number into perspective, 
We've seen the levels um, that we've seen uh, in 2020, uh, pretty much 20 years ago. Uh, so we've retrogressed uh, in South Africa 20 years uh, back, and the levels that we've seen in 2020 are the ones that we actually recorded around uh, the year 2000. So we've got a lot of catching up to do, and uh, we are very excited, obviously, about the possibility of um, the electromobility, because for us, it's not just about electric vehicles only. We're looking at electromobility as a much bigger conversation so that we can really be able to make sure that we are not talking just about electric vehicles. We're also talking about connected vehicles uh, that can be able to talk to one another on the road. We're also talking about autonomous driving and uh, also, you know, um, shared mobility because uh, people are moving very, uh, you know, gradually from using and buying uh, vehicles for their own, um, you know, uh, consumption, but obviously getting into a lot of shared mobility. So there's been some very interesting uh, trends that we've seen uh, in 2020 that I think will, will give us a very good perspective as we go forward mm. uh, into, into 2021. Right. Uh, Sulaisha, perhaps uh, come in here and give us the Indian perspective. I mean, as we talk about how much catching up South Africa's uh, car market has to do, uh, what is the state of play in India right now as we do prepare to wrap up the first quarter of 2021? How much catching up do you have to do and also the role that electrification will play in that catch up? Could you just unmute for us? I really uh, look forward to the days when uh, just by virtue of you talking, uh, the unmute button is done for you automatically, but we're not quite there yet. Well, hi, I'm happy to be here on this, uh, uh, this, this talk with all of you and congratulations to IMC for hosting this seminar. Um, as, you, as you rightly said, uh, last year has been a difficult year for the entire automobile industry. Uh, but we are certainly seeing a demand uh, uptake in India uh, across all the sectors of automotive uh, 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 sector. And we expect that this year, 2021, uh, will be a better year, given that uh, there is uh, the COVID uh, vaccine around the corner. Um, and overall, there is an improvement in the consumer index, uh, confidence index. Uh, coming to electric vehicles, I think you must have been seeing that uh, India has been uh, very committed to electrification of the transportation sector. India is one of the largest uh, automobile markets in the world. Um, and the government here has decided that the route for electrification in India is not going to be through cars. So it is not going to be the Teslas, which is going to fire up the India's electrification story, but it is going to be green mobility for the masses. So the focus is going to be on electrification of the two-wheeler sector and the three-wheeler sector, as well as public transport like buses. The government here is very keen that India takes a lead on the electrification of their two-wheeler, three-wheeler and buses, uh, brings the benefits of electric vehicles to the common man. Uh, we know that electric vehicles are much cheaper to run, uh, 40 pesa a kilometer vis-a-vis -vis 4 rupees uh, for diesel vehicles. So there's a big savings. Uh, the fuel prices here have gone through the roof. Petrol is costing 100 rupees a liter. So I think people are very interested to look at uh, how uh, quickly they can transition to electric vehicles. And uh, I think that in the coming decade, uh, India will see a rapid move towards electrification, especially for two wheelers and three wheelers, um, also supported by the falling battery prices. Along with the electric vehicles, the auto component industry is looking at investing in this sector to you know, make the parts locally. Uh, there are charging companies which are setting up shop here to provide the charging infrastructure. So I believe that the entire ecosystem will get fueled in this decade and it will create new jobs, uh, it will create new technologies uh, in the area of, uh, of course, electric vehicles, their components, the charging infrastructure, batteries, battery cells maybe also, and also services like the fleet aggregation, IoT, software. So many new opportunities will come about. Um, and I think all this will be, will be fueled by the fact that the battery prices are coming down. So electric vehicles will become cheaper, not only greener, but cheaper alternative for people. And hopefully this will really go a long way in uh, reducing pollution in India, which is uh, you know, a big cause of concern. 
Yeah. So I believe that the coming decade uh, will be the decade of uh, rapid electrification of India's transport sector. Right. Yeah, and the price has traditionally been uh, one of the deterrents uh, to um, increased uptake in more electric cars. And Janiko, if we can just get an opening remark uh, from you, as you are one of the players in South Africa currently that uh, does produce uh, an electric car in the form of your Jaguar I-Pace. Uh, just describe to us uh, what demand has been like, uh, uptake for the uh, car has been like, which is in the uh, higher uh, end or higher segment of the market presently. So, thank you for having me. Uh, overall, the electric car industry in South Africa is still in its infancy. We're, we're making up less than 1% of the total sales, as Mike uh, mentioned earlier. So, it is still a new technology. It is, and there's limited players in the market. But most of the vehicles sourced from South Africa and, uh, and the rest of Africa are largely sourced out of markets that are rapidly ad adopting EV as a, a mainstream and have announced very d definite stages of moving from ISO internal combustion engines to plug-in hybrids and full, full electric. So it, it's, it's essential that we, uh, we follow that trend, that global trend, because we might be left behind. We might not have vehicles to sell in, in Africa. Uh, we've, we've also seen that these African countries, for example, Mauritius, it's been very successful in introducing EV. Um, some of our product lines have grown by 10% or 10 times over um, just with the introduction of very progressive duty rates and structures on EV and plug-in hybrid. So there is definitely a market for EV um, vehicles currently with the correct duty and support, but also looking to the future, that will be the option that's available to us. And we, we can't imagine that Africa and the rest of the world won't follow these global trends. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the, um, the argument can be made that we won't have a choice but to follow these uh, global trends. Uh, Mikhail, you gave us the statistic in your opening remark regarding uh, just how big our export market was. 64% uh, of the cars made locally here uh, are for exports. And they're made in markets that are speeding up regulation towards lower carbon emission cars. I believe that in, uh, in the UK by 2030, cars as we know them today uh, will be banned. And also in China by 2035 or so, um, Half of the uh, cars in that market will be um, combustible, hybrid combustible engines, the other half electric. So uh, South Africa can't afford to uh, fall behind, uh, particularly if reg regulation uh, bans the cars that we're currently making uh, from entering our, our main market. So my question to you then is, how is the industry aligning for this future to protect current market share? Well, absolutely. I think these are some of the conversations we're currently having uh, with government and also with other stakeholders so that we can really be able to make sure that we accelerate um, the adoption of electric vehicles uh, in South Africa. And as I indicated earlier on, for us, it's a very big deal because we produce uh, vehicles that uh, are going into Europe in the main. I mean, uh, three out of every vehicle that we export out of South Africa goes into Europe. And uh, many European countries have already given us notice. So we know for a fact that in the next uh, you know, nine to, to, to 15 years, uh, those vehicles will not be going into those markets, uh, which will obviously have a, mass, a massive implication for, uh, for our production capacity. And also remember that South Africa has developed what we call the automotive master plan, where we really want to double our current uh, production capacity by the uh, uh, year 2035. Um, and there's no way that we will obviously be able to reach those um, uh, levels uh, if we do not, um, you know, quickly, uh, you know, uh, create a fertile uh, regulatory environment so that we can really be able to make sure that uh, South Africa has the capacity to, um, you know, to move with the trends. So we are working very closely with government. In fact, this week, Thursday, we are meeting with the Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition here in South Africa so that we can be able to debate some of the uh, important regulatory reforms that we, re we need in order to be able to provide some certainty uh, because, as you know, a lot of uh, global companies uh, are, you know, multinational corporations. Um, and in order for them to be able to make investment decisions, they need some regulatory um, certainty. Um, and uh, we need to be able to be very clear about where the country is moving and what our position is on electric vehicles. So, so South Africa is definitely, you know, uh, forced, unfortunately, to conform and to work very hard to make sure that we introduce these measures uh, sooner rather than later.
Mm. I mean, perhaps the kind of regulatory uncertainty that we are seeing coming out of India by way of the support uh, that country is giving for or giving to electric and also green mobility. And Sulaj, as you uh, spoke about um, the plans for the two wheelers and the three wheelers and, and, and the buses there in India to, 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 to ramp up production um, a lot more in, in, in terms of cleaner and greener vehicles. I'm interested in your, your plans for the continent. I mean, how, much, how many of those vehicles do you see uh, finding a home here in Africa? Traditionally, it has been uh, quite a strong demand pi pipeline from the continent. Um, what are your forecasts uh, for, for, for the current production line? Well, as you rightly said, um, Indian automobiles, especially motorcycles and also the rickshaws or three-wheelers, are very popular across Africa. And Indian brands enjoy uh, great respect. Uh, they're seen as good quality vehicles. And uh, certainly, uh, therefore, there are many opportunities for collaboration uh, also on the electric vehicle front. Incidentally, even for Africa, I believe uh, that the route to electrification should be by using electric motorcycles and electric uh, rickshaws rather than electric cars. Um, also because most of the cars in, us, in Africa are imported, so it's difficult to have a uh, used and imported, so it's difficult to have electric uh, used and imported cars. And also because there's no charging infrastructure available across the continent. So it would be easier to first uh, bring electric motorcycles, scooters and rickshaws, which are used mostly within the cities. And Africa, of course, is getting highly urbanized rapidly. Uh, so in pockets where there's good electrification, I think uh, electric uh, two-wheelers and three-wheelers should be uh, uh, deployed. And I think Indian companies and also Indian government and African government can collaborate to create such opportunities. Uh, we would have to consciously work towards this. Uh, today, there is no policy framework in place uh, for electric vehicles in Africa, whether it's import duties, which tend to be higher than uh, fossil fuel vehicles whether it's regulation for registration, which is non-existent, uh, whether it's subsidies which are required to make electric vehicles uh, more attractive, which are currently not available. So I think we should work uh, together. And certain countries like Nigeria, Uganda, Angola, where Indian vehicles are popular, uh, we can certainly introduce some, um, do some pilot projects to bring motorcycle taxis, uh, to create livelihood programs using electric vehicles for delivery or for waste management. Uh, or for vending articles like uh, vegetables and you know other daily articles so that people get exposed to electric vehicles and then slowly the awareness and acceptance will build ecosystem will build um, and i'm sure in the long run uh, you know maybe i'm looking at a few years down the line that the demand for electric vehicles uh, would rise but i think it would have to be a conscious effort to look at policies to look mm -hmm. at uh, livelihood or other programs look at duty structures and create some examples uh, to demonstrate the benefits of electric vehicles uh, for which the uh, governments should work together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Janiko, just to um, uh, come back to the, I mean, the issue of price that was raised and, and also what we have seen with the I-PACE because uh, we have all seen the um, influencer campaign that Jaguar has, has used with some of the prominent um, influential uh, young uh, South Africans uh, who, who are driving, driving your cars. And there's one that comes to mind whereby the car is uh, parked in the garage and uh, the, um, a certain lady just uh, takes out her charging station and she plugs it into uh, the wall. So just um, is that where it ends by way of charging station? Is it something that uh, will be limited? to an individual's home or for Jaguar to also ramp up its um, presence in the electric car market, would we need a, a perhaps a, a mass rollout of charging stations across uh, the country nationally? If you could just talk to me about the, uh, the dynamics there. So Jaguar Land Rover has already invested 60 million rand in infrastructure across South Africa. So electrifying the N1 driving to Cape Town, driving to Durban, driving to certain areas up north. So we've already invested in heavily in infrastructure. We still believe that the main source and main points and most effective and cheapest way of charging would be at home. Uh, a lot of that is driven by customer behavior. Uh, electric vehicles are closer to a uh, cell phone, actually, when it comes to usage, by charging overnight, charging when electricity rates are actually lower the, the most effective charging would be at home. So at night when you get home and you charge your vehicle, you, you, you wake up with a, a fully charged uh, vehicle. In the case of I-Pace, it's over 400 kilometers of range. 
So home charging, we, we think, will remain the, the main, charge, main point of charging. However, infrastructure will assist in longer trips and longer uh, long distance driving. Okay. But I suppose uh, that's if you've got electricity at home uh, to begin with, uh, to charge your car. Um, the power shortages in Africa are very well known and uh, very well uh, known for the deterrent that they are in terms of uh, you know, further investments in the space. So Michael, just talk to me around uh, the industry's thinking around uh, power security. I mean, are we seeing a saving grace in the uh, fact that we are accelerating our push to uh, get a lot more renewables um, into our energy mix? Or is that, that perhaps perhaps uh, still a long way away to giving us the power security we need right now? Well, absolutely. So we are very encouraged. I mean, the news that were announced uh, last week by the Minister uh, of Energy, uh, Minister Mantashe, when he announced, uh, for an example, the eight independent power producers uh, that are going to be working with government in order to produce um, additional um, you know, capacity to be able to augment the national grid, I think that's uh, definitely the way to go because certainly we know that ESCOM has been battling with um, load shedding. Uh, and the last thing we want, um, you know, is to have a situation where uh, the rollout of, of electric vehicles in South Africa is, fat, is fast tracked, but we, we do not have the uh, capacity to can be able to make sure that we charge uh, these vehicles. I mean, as Jenico said, uh, you know, the preference will be certainly be at home. Uh, but if uh, our homes are, do not have electricity, we we'll still have a challenge uh, in terms of making sure that we are able to power uh, the, these vehicles accordingly. So, and then I think one of the challenges that we have in South Africa is the vast, um, you know, country that we have. Uh, in order for a person to travel from Palabora, which is up north, up until Cape Town, uh, you need a, at least about three, maybe four charges uh, along that main road on the N1 to be able to get to, to Cape Town. And we need to be able to give people that level of comfort that they can be able to get onto those long journeys, uh, particularly as we're going into Easter in the next week or so, uh, you know, people can be able to comfortably get onto their electric vehicles and, and do those long, uh, you know, trips. And I think it has been a, a very major challenge as well in terms of uh, adoption, because a lot of people are very skeptical whether will we have enough infrastructure capability in order for us to be able to make sure that and we are able to charge vehicles. And I think we're also, you know, working very closely with the private sector as well, so that we can be able to make sure that private sector companies, uh, we're having a very interesting conversations now uh, with our oil companies, for example, that are currently uh, providing, uh, you, know, um, um, you know, fuel uh, to say to what extent can they also play a role uh, in terms of deploying charging stations in their current infrastructure. Because already there is a, there's an infrastructure already that is existing all you need to do is obviously to deploy uh, those charging stations in that existing infra infrastructure instead of building new white elephant infrastructure that no one will be able to use in the future. So, so we're looking at different uh, ways to make sure that we are able to make sure that South Africa uh, is able to make sure that the rollout of infrastructure is solid and it's able to cover uh, the length and breadth uh, of, um, uh, of the country because we also want rural areas as well to be able to adopt uh, you know electric vehicles because we don't want these electric vehicles to only be uh, you know um, in in our major cities we also want uh, you know rural areas our townships to also have infrastructure that people can be able to depend on yeah, uh, agreed. I mean, uh, you're talking about white um, infrastructure uh, and um, just thinking that uh, it's, it's something that we can ill afford to waste money on uh, any form of uh, building or any form of infrastructure out there that uh, we don't end up using. But Solaja, just uh, coming back to your point regarding um, unlocking the, inf in the investment bottlenecks in, in this space. So what we did witness throughout the uh, COVID-19 lockdown pandemics was the disruption to uh, supply chains that a lot of manufacturers experienced as a result of uh, things being locked down. And as a result, as we're talking about building back better, a lot of economies are trying to position or strengthen their localization strategies to, you know, prevent uh, that kind of disturbance in the event of the next crisis. I'm just interested in the plans that your company has for perhaps ramping up its uh, manufacturing uh, facilities um, or even entering uh, more manufacturing here on the continent. As uh, many countries talk about increasing localization and uh, the benefits that it can accrue for both um, the foreign country and also the, the incumbent where you plan to set up, what's your localization strategy for Africa? 
So uh, certainly, as far as the Indian market goes, uh, we are extremely focused on localization. In fact, Kinetic Inc. has almost 100% of its supply chain localized, even for its electric vehicles. And we have been working really hard to develop the components, to work with the local suppliers here to ramp that up. And that's also in line with the vision of the Indian government to have localized the EV technology. So when it comes to the uh, localization strategy for the African continent, I do believe, uh, and I'm convinced that electric vehicles is the future of automotive technology. And in fact, the coming decade will set pace to accelerate the uh, you know, uh, EV deployment. And probably by 2040, a large part of the global transportation sector will be electric. And maybe by 2050, only a few percentage of special vehicles may be using you know, fossil fuels. So the world is moving to electric. And I think therefore Africa, which also has a climate change problem, which is also developing, whether it's urbanization, electric, electric, uh, electrification, availability of electricity, I think certainly will uh, increase its uh, deployment uh, of electric vehicles. So this is in inevitable. So as the market develops, as more electric vehicles are demanded in Africa, as it becomes a large market for electric vehicles, certainly manufacturers like us would like to come and be closer to the market. Today is still very nascent. We need to work hard to create the initial population and ecosystem for electric vehicles, the right policies, the right framework to attract electric vehicles. But in the long run, once we create a few million vehicles in the market, certainly it will accelerate demand and I think manufacturers would then like to come and be closer to your markets um, and make vehicles required specifically by the African customers uh, with the right features, you know, with the right value of proposition. So I think we've just begun the journey. The journey is certainly in the direction of electric vehicles, but there's a long way to go. And I do hope that the Indian and African companies and governments will collaborate to create the right ecosystem and policy framework right now to pave way for this great future ahead. Yeah, I agree, um, and I hope uh, for the same, because ultimately a, collabor a collaboration like that will be um, a, a spin-off for both economies and, uh, more critically, uh, jobs. But, Janiko, can you just drive us through your, your forecasts as you see um, the EV market unwinding? Uh, we, uh, or you dropped that statistic at the beginning of the conversation that uh, currently, I believe, is at less than 1% or so of cars in South Africa, or perhaps Africa, are, are EVs. So talk to us about Jaguar's uh, plan uh, for the future. Uh, Solaja spoke about the fact that she's expecting the adoption of EVs to accelerate rapidly within the next 10 years. What are your forecasts? And perhaps if you just add to that the major risks to realizing those targets? So Jaguar Land Rover is committed to electric future. Jaguar will be fully electric by 2025 and Land Rover will welcome six new pure electric vehicles in the next five years with the ultimate goal of being co um, net zero carbon business by 2039. So from a Jaguar Land Rover point of view, that is the direction of our business. That's where we, we're going. Um, to speculate on the rates of um, adoption, uh, that's, a, that's a very difficult question. Uh, I can only comment from, from Jago Landrover's position is that it is a definite direction of our business to introduce electric vehicles and increase the availability of electric vehicles um, over the next five years and going further. So projections can be anywhere between 15 and 30 uh, percent, but there is a number of variables in this mix that will that will change that could change that everything from infrastructure uh, to support by government when it comes to duties uh, what we need is to see more automotive uh, manufacturers entering the market um, in south africa we've had commitment of more manufacturers actually entering the market in the very near future so we believe we need a thriving industry to to get to get ev um, to mass adoption. So the quicker we can get more manufacturers to, to bring vehicles to South Africa and Africa, uh, the quicker that adoption rate will be. All right. 
And just finally, Michael, uh, your uh, closing thoughts. I mean, as you prepare for your uh, much important meeting with the minister later um, this week uh, regarding the plans for, for the car market. I mean, we've already heard the fact that we as a continent don't actually have an electric um, or electrification policy to begin with, uh, that uh, import duties are a lot higher on electric cars than they are on, you know, the more harmful fossil fuel um, cars, as it were, and that we are lacking in sub subsidies and tax incentives to uh, get investments into the sector flowing. So closing comments and also a, a response to how you're likely to put these issues to the minister when you do meet. Well, look, I think our message is very clear that uh, the time to, you know, for procrastination, uh, you know, has come and gone. You know, we need to now firm up and um, make decisions that are firm and not only in the interest of South Africa, but certainly in the interest of the of the entire continent. Because remember, we are now a member of a, a, a regional, a continental bloc uh, since the beginning of January this year, uh, after the signing of the Africa uh, Free Trade, uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. And, and, and we really want to uh, you know, work with the all other sister countries uh, across the continent so that we can really accelerate not just only the adoption of electric vehicles into the continent, uh, but certainly to make sure that Africa is able to take its place uh, in terms of making sure that we are able to contribute meaningfully uh, towards the growth and the development of uh, the automotive sector uh, globally, because we've been left behind uh, and we've really not been uh, very active. We've got some amazing uh, opportunities, particularly in terms of localization, because a lot of uh, products that we have uh, that goes into many of our manufacturing process uh, are actually endowed and coming from from Africa as a, as a whole. So, so we really need to be able to uh, create a, a very stable regulatory environment mm -hmm. in South Africa and across the continent so that we can really be able to play um, you know, as aggressively as uh, we have ever done before uh, globally because a lot of these multinational uh, companies depend on Africa uh, in terms of sourcing of their raw materials. And we need to be able to sit firmly on that main table so that we can really be able to firm up and say, this is the contribution that we are making. If you look at the battery packs, for example, and the battery manufacturing, a lot of the raw materials for those batteries are coming out of Africa. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to set the tone differently so that we can really be able to make sure that uh, we take this industry uh, towards a different direction. Uh, you know, and, and I think in the next couple of years, we need to be able to step up as a, as a, as a continent. Exactly. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for those uh, closing remarks and nothing further to add uh, there. But just to say, uh, you know, 100 percent in agreement with uh, what you and the rest of the panelists have uh, shared. Um, what is quite interesting is the fact that, I mean, you can actually see a, a lot of support from the investment community into these industries of the future. I mean, you just take the growth of a Tesla in such a short space of time as a prime example. In fact, right now, that company is sitting at a higher market capitalization than Ford, GM and Fiat Chrysler. Chrysler combined and uh, showing the fact that uh, there will be support and there can be financial support towards these investments if, if of course, we do have that, pol that policy framework uh, to ensure uh, that those investments will be kept safe. But thanks so much to uh, the uh, panel and uh, have yourselves a great afternoon. And uh, with that note, I hand it back to uh, Zanati, who has been doing a fantastic job uh, at day one of the Indo-Africa uh, Summit as your MC, uh, Zanati. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's back to you to do your thing. Yep, thank you very much, Fifi. It is indeed uh, very encouraging that the uh, private automotive uh, uh, sector will be meeting with the South African government uh, as early as a Thursday. Of course, we do uh, know that we do need to cultivate a fertile regulatory environment for those investments to come in in terms of the electrification of the transport system in South Africa. And what was interesting for me uh, is uh, the comments that were made that we do need to bring those electric vehicles to the common man, to the townships, and uh, to rural areas.